You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between two people about a flat. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello, this is Simon Marshall. I spoke to you the other day about renting flat three A. Oh yes. Hello, Simon. What can I do for you? Well, there are a few health and safety things I'd like to run through, if that's okay. Yes, fine. Right. Well, the first thing, bearing in mind it's quite an old house, is whether there's any damp. I'm thinking here of the exterior walls and the floor. Well, I've never known any problems with damp there. It was all right last time I checked, certainly, though that was before the recent wet weather. I'd better have another look and get back to you on that. Okay. Now the next thing is the gas supply. Do you have a safety certificate, a current one, that is? We do. All the gas appliances have been checked by a registered engineer. Yes, I was going to ask about that. When did they actually do the inspection? Let me think. They sent an engineer to check something early last year, but no, that wasn't the inspection. Oh, I remember now. It was in the spring. In fact, I've got the certificate here somewhere. Yes, that's it. March twenty second. So it's just over five months ago. And the electricity. When was the last time all the wiring was inspected? I know it doesn't have to be checked as often as the gas, but it's still important, especially in older properties. As it happens, we had an electrician in when we redecorated flat three A. If he looked at everything, then he would have charged us for it. I'll find the bill and check it if you like. Fine. And when was that? Uh, the decorators finished just before Easter, so that would be about eighteen months ago.、Mm -hmm. Just one more point on the electrics. Are there enough plug sockets in the flat? It depends what you mean by enough, really. Well, I've got quite a lot of electrical things: computer, radio, lamps, kitchen appliances, and so on. And I'm wondering whether I could plug them all in without having cables trailing all over the place. I think there's one per room. That's fairly normal in older properties. <laughs> I'll take that as a no then. <laughs> all right. Now another safety point. Is there a smoke alarm? Yes, there's one in the kitchen. And is it in good working order? I'll have to try it out and let you know. Right. Now you mentioned the previous tenants. Do they or anyone else who's lived in the flat still have keys to the door? We're very strict about that. Everyone has to hand back the keys when they leave, or we don't return the deposit. And those in three A have always done so.
Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Okay. Now there are a few other practical details. Firstly, you mentioned a room where people can leave things like suitcases and bags and things. Where exactly is that? Is it next to three A, which I take it is on the third floor? Well, the apartment's on the third, yes, but the storeroom's a little way away, just past the second door to the right, under the stairs, in fact. But it's on the same floor, isn't it? Yes, it is. Fine. Now another thing I wanted to check is that there's hot water in the apartment. Oh yes, it runs off the central heating. That was installed back in the seventies, I think. So there's a permanent supply. Hmm. But is it really hot? Not just warm or lukewarm. I suppose it depends what you mean by hot. But it's at a constant sixty degrees. Oh, that sounds fine. Yes, it used to be set at fifty-five, but last year the tenants asked us to increase it, so we did. Oh, I'm glad about that. Okay, now can you tell me a bit about the yard and the garden? How big are they? Well, the yard at the side of the house is about twenty square meters. Oh, so there's room for my motorbike then. Actually, it's only a fifty cc moped, but I like to keep it off the road at night. Yes, there's more than enough space there, even with all the wheelie bins. And the garden? That's much bigger, about a hundred and fifty square meters.、Uh -huh. Um, who looks after it, by the way? Old Mr. Collins. He's almost ninety, but he's out there every day. Ah,、uh -huh. and the last point, the TV. What size screen is it? It's seventy centimeters wide, I think. No, sorry, that was the old one. This one's eighty. You can get ninety odd channels on it, so I'm told. Really? So there's a satellite dish on the roof, is there? No, it's cable TV here. It doesn't cost much between everyone, though. Ah, that's very interesting. Okay, thanks for your help. I'll be in touch again soon. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. That is the end of section one. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a guide named Matt, who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. Now you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen to the first part of the introduction carefully, and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax. There are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So, if peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the national park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room 
and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible and only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow, there is a Beachcombers and Rock Hoppers tour exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach. Or, if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course, that includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in. But I would recommend my favorite tour, the Waterfall Walk. This departs at sundown each day, and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. In the second part of the introduction, you are going to get some advice from Matt. Listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the National Park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time, it's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the National Park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. Dinner is from 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. This is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing the crop rice. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. 
Good morning, everyone. So, following on from our tutorial on European agriculture last week, Daisy and Eric are going to talk about the most commonly grown crop in Asia, which is, of course, rice. Eric, can you tell us what you've been working on? Yes,、yeah, sure. We've been looking at the role of rice in a number of countries, how it's grown, ways of increasing production. As I'm sure you know, rice is the staple diet throughout Asia, and in fact, 90% of the world's rice is grown and eaten there. Daisy's got some background on that. Um, well, rice was originally a wild plant which started out in the tropical regions of Asia, but there are literally hundreds of varieties today, and each with different qualities.、Uh, for instance, one will survive floods. While another will grow in relatively dry conditions, a third has a really lovely smell. But wherever it grows, rice needs a lot of water. What do you mean by a lot? Well, it takes about five thousand liters to get a kilogram of rice. This can be supplied either naturally or by irrigation. And as most rice-growing countries suffer from unpredictable weather, including drought, water management really is the key. Research has become so important now that each rice-growing country in Asia has its own research institute. Whether we're talking about Japan, China, or Bangladesh, and they're all coordinated by a group in the Philippines called the International Rice Research Institute. Interesting. Bangladesh, for instance, has been successfully using different rice varieties and fertilizers for thirty years. But because it's such a flat delta country, it's very difficult for the water to drain away after the monsoon season. So they need to find special rice crops that can survive the floods. And with global warming, the situation is more urgent than ever. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Now I'd like to move on to our comparative study. As you can imagine, China is the world's biggest rice-producing country. Collectively, the Chinese people probably eat more than three billion bowls of rice every day. Quite a statistic.、Mm. And of course, rice plays an important cultural role too. We then compared China to Thailand. You know, even though Thailand only has about 64 million people, it's the world's number one exporter of rice. Not China, as you might imagine. Is that so? Yes, they send their rice everywhere, in particular to Europe as well as Africa and the Middle East. Apparently, the fact that jasmine rice is growing in popularity is one reason why Thailand's rice export industry is doing so well. People want something a bit different, and of course, Thailand is well suited to rice growing. Good climatic conditions and lots of fresh water. Going back to China for a minute, we should mention that at the Rice Research Institute in Huangzhou, they're working on ways of improving rice yields using less water. By yields, you mean the amount they can grow? Yes, they're trying to find ways to get more rice from less land. Improve the taste, but also have other things in it besides carbohydrates, so that it's healthier, better for you. Good idea, considering it's the staple food. And then you've got Japan, which is totally self-sufficient when it comes to rice. This is basically because they have a high tariff on imported rice, so everyone buys the homegrown product, and they don't export much. Yes, but you know, even though rice is a kind of sacred crop there. Consumption is only half what it was in the 1960s. 
This trend isn't evident in Thailand or China. Interesting that you mentioned how rice is almost sacred in Japan, because I believe in Thailand it also plays an important cultural role. Absolutely, they have the royal ploughing ceremony every year, which the king always attends, and he actually scatters a new stock of seed to the farmers, who pour into Bangkok for the event. What about the global interest in organic farming? Is there such a thing as organically grown rice? Yes, indeed. And the Japanese are getting quite a taste for it, apparently. There's an experimental farm near the city of Akita in the Japanese rice belt, famous for its sake, by the way, which has pioneered organic rice production, and now it's sold all across the country. It's a bit like the recent popularity of jasmine rice in Thailand, but that's for the export market, of course. Interesting how attitudes change, isn't it? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about writing for radio. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. We're going to move on today to look at some of the key principles of writing for radio. Of course, the main thing that you have to remember is that a radio script is not written to be read, but to be spoken and heard. Now, putting this into practice is more difficult than it seems, because writing as we speak. Involves abandoning many of the normal rules of writing that have been taught to us from an early age. This is because we need to concentrate on how the piece sounds. Written words convey information, but they don't convey the full meaning of what you want to say. They don't tell you what to emphasise, what speed something should be read at, or where the pauses should come. So these have to be indicated in a script. Whatever is said on radio. Whether it's a link to a magazine program, a film review, or even a voice piece in the news, needs to sound as if it's coming from the mind of the speaker, almost like part of a conversation, rather than something that's being read. Before you begin to write, it's a good idea to know who you're talking to, to visualise a typical member of the radio station's audience. If you're writing a film review for a local audience, for example. Think about how you tell your grandmother about the film, or if you're reviewing a pop concert, think about how you tell your friend about the band. The words have much more impact if each person feels they're being spoken to directly, so your tone needs to be informal, rather than using impersonal words like listeners or the audience. You can make it more informal. Include them in what you're saying by referring to us and we. Once you know who you're talking to, the next thing is to work out what you're going to say. Don't forget that the person listening to you has no opportunity to ask questions, and in the same way, you can't repeat what you've just said. For these reasons, it's important that your script is logical and progresses smoothly. Too many facts too close together will cause confusion. 
so space them out evenly. The best scripts allow listeners to visualize what you're describing. For example, instead of giving the physical dimensions of a field, describe it as being the size of, say, a football pitch. If you're talking about a tall building, relate it to perhaps a ten-story block of flats. Now, all scripts need something that will grab the attention of the listener. You need something that'll make them say, "Hey, I want to stop and listen to this." So the first sentence has to do this for you. It needs to be intriguing, interesting, and then it needs to be backed up by a second sentence that explains what you're talking about. The last sentence should also give your listeners food for thought, and can be in the form of a question or a statement that sums up the item. After you've finished your script, you need to polish it up, and the most effective method of doing this is by reading it aloud. This also helps you to avoid tongue twisters or words that you might find awkward to pronounce. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.